Hi, welcome to Mama Fuel. My name is Anne Ferguson. I am your host, and I'm thrilled to bring you this podcast that was created to fuel every mama's heart, soul, mind, and body, and hopefully spark a dream or two along the way. My mission is to change the way that we mamas treat ourselves and each other so that we feel better, live happier lives, and change the world one happier family at a time. In the Mama Feel podcast, I'm sharing real, raw, and often funny conversations with amazing mamas from around the world to remind you that you're not alone and that you're doing amazingly on this wild journey of being a gorgeous woman shepherding small humans as they make their way on a beautiful planet. You are amazing, and I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Mama Fuel. I just finished recording this conversation with Shermaine Phillip, and I'm struggling to do justice to it in this introduction. I can only urge you to listen to this conversation with both of your ears, your heart, and your mind wide open. Shermaine is living in East London, raising her little eight-year-old boy in the best ways that she knows how teaching him through the exquisite art that she makes about different aspects of his heritage, his culture, society, what her values are, what their values are as a family, and how to face into the world and some of the challenges and opportunities that it offers. I really appreciate Shermaine's willingness to be brave and have this conversation with me. It's the first time she's recorded a podcast. She is an artist and supports herself and her son that way. And the work that she creates is incredibly meaningful, very soulful and beautiful, beautiful. In fact, I'd love to have some hanging on my wall. I will put all of the links to all of that in the show notes and give you ways that you can connect in with Shermaine. But I really hope that her messages about raising a black son in today's East London community, teaching him about society and the way that people may or may not treat him while keeping an open heart and an approach and value of kindness at the forefront of everything that he does and that she does. I really hope that that message lands and I appreciate her invitation to all of us to lead with kindness, no matter what our own culture, heritage, or circumstances are. Because every single person we meet at one point was someone else's baby, someone else's hopefully very beloved child. I'll leave it there. I hope to hear what you think of this episode. I would love it if you would leave a review in Apple Podcasts or if you would come into the Mama Fuel Virtual Village, which is our free Facebook group. Join us there and join the conversation because Shermaine has graciously accepted to participate in a Q&A following the publication of this podcast. I also wanted to remind you of the incredible importance of being in community and of taking time for yourself. I'm feeling a little bit ranty about this right now. And I am hosting Mama's Urban Retreats in Zurich, in Egg, and in Geneva between now and the end of the year. If you go to mamafuel.me forward slash urban retreats, you can find the dates and locations there. I cannot encourage you enough to come and meet me. Take four hours for yourself, irrespective of whether the little one has had a bad night or other things are going on or you're feeling pressure to do other things. Creating and honoring time for yourself as a human even more perhaps as a mother, is so vital to your well-being and to your happiness and therefore to your family's happiness and well-being. Really, honestly, get yourself to a yoga class, get yourself to a squash game, get yourself to a run, get yourself to something that helps you take care of yourself because you will be the healthier in mind, body, and spirit And you will then show up that way in your family and everybody is going to be the better for it. So if you're in Geneva, in Egg or in Zurich, please check out mamafuel.me forward slash retreats and join me for four hours of meditation, yoga, journaling, amazing conversation, hugs, laughter and community. And if you're not in any of those places and you wish that this was happening close to you, 
I love to travel. So simply drop me an email at Anne, A-N-N-E, at mamafuel.me, and I will come to you and host one of these urban retreats near where you live, and we can work together to get about 10 mamas together to make that happen. Right. Back to this conversation with Charmaine, which I can't wait to listen to again. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Mama Fuel, the podcast. I am Ann Ferguson, your host, and I have been looking forward to this week's conversation for months. And I'm so excited that Shermaine Phillip and I were able to finally find a time to make this happen. Shermaine is an incredibly gifted artist, a huge hearted woman, mama of a beautiful little guy who she's raising super consciously particularly as relates to what is going on in the world that surrounds him, what goes on in the world that surrounds her, and greater social issues from immigration, colonialism, racism, only to name a couple of isms and a shun, (laughs) and so much more. So without any further ado, let's really get started because there are so many things that Charmaine and I could talk about that one podcast may not be enough. Charmaine, welcome and thank you for being willing to be my guest. I know this is a little nervous making as an experience. (laughs) Indeed, thank you for having me though. Well, it's such a pleasure. So let's start by giving everyone who's listening some context. Can you tell us what your life looks like right now? So right now I am officially a stay at home mama. uh, I guess in everybody else's eyes, but I am a freelance artist. So I work from home, um, doing, I've got some of my stuff back here that you can mm-hmm. see, uh, making my art. This is also my art studio, by the way. So everything that I do is based from my home and from my bedroom. Um, uh, and yes, I have a little eight-year-old boy that I love dearly. Um, and he's kind of the reason why I am a stay-at-home artist trying to make, make stuff for him and to color the world that he lives in. That's awesome. And there's so much more underlying that. So um, tell us a little bit about your entrance into motherhood. Uh, So my labor story is kind of cool. So I'll tell that. Uh, I was completely oblivious to the fact that I was in labor or not oblivious. I knew and looking back, I definitely knew because I remember wiping my head like this and it was wet with sweat (laughs) at the time. I was just like, oh, I must be hot. And I remember Googling, um, Googling, can you have, can, can you, can your baby come early? It was only two days early, but I was convinced he was going to be late because he was my first baby. And that's what I'd been told. Mm -hmm. And I knew he was feet first. And I was also told that can make them kind of stay in there for much longer. So I was convinced also because I don't think I was ready for him to come. So I was convinced he wasn't coming that day, but he clearly Mm. was because I had these massive pains. I thought it was because I was hungry. So I went downstairs to make myself some beans on toast. (laughs) I remember wiping my head and it was wet. I remember walking up the stairs and having to stop because of the cramps, because of the contractions, not connecting that they were contractions, just like, oh, I'm really hungry still. And then, as as um, often happens, you know, when you're hungry, walking up the stairs, you have to stop yeah, because often. of the <laughs> hunger pains. Yeah, <laughs> I was completely, I was in a massive denial. I just wasn't ready for him to arrive. And nobody was home either. My partner was working away. He normally has a car. He didn't go in the car because we ju- he just sold the car. Um, he was working way in South East London somewhere. And I was in East London. So it was about an hour and a half away. Wow. And then I was on the phone to my friend and she was like, are you okay? Because I kept pausing to make noises because my stomach was hurting me. And I said, I'm not sure. She goes, Shemaine, maybe go and have a shower. So I went in the shower and I was in there for ages. uh, And I phoned her when I came back out. And when I was on the phone to her, my waters broke. Wow. And she went, I think you should call the midwife. So I was like, okay. I called the midwife and literally... I think it was half an hour after my waters broke. My son came, was delivered, (gasps) feet first, at home. My partner walked through the door just as I got off the phone to my friend. So as my, before my water, my waters broke, my partner came through the door. 
he'd asked the bus driver as well to drop him to the train station, not to where the bus terminates is. So he was like, I think my partner's in labor. You've got to take me to the station. I can't. I thought the bus stopped at the station and the bus driver took him, which Aww. is another nice little story. Um, and then... Yeah, and when we opened, when I opened the door, or my partner opened the door, um, all of the emergency service people were lined up outside my bedroom door. <laughs> and he said it felt like they were waiting there because they were scared to come in. And uh, you know what it's like when you have a baby, you're kind of in the zone. The place, in the zone. And I had no clothes on at all because every time we tried to get dressed, another contraction came. So I'd pull up my the tightest clothes that my partner could find to take me to hospital. I didn't find me like tracksuit buttons, <laughs> like leggings and a vest top or something I was trying to put on <laughs> while oh, having a baby. Funny. And uh, um, so we opened the door and the emergency people came in and they said, hello. I remember them going, hello, dear. Would you like to put some clothes on? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was completely naked and oblivious. And then um, I remember loads of bits of, what happened but I don't remember what the room looked like or anything it was a completely it's not something that's in my mind at all but my partner said it looked like somebody had died in the room not that we'd just given birth to a baby I remember when we were getting wheeled into the hospital I looked at him and he had um like blood splatters all up the side of his face and on his shirt and I was like ew (laughs) <laughs> what's wrong why are you like that like don't come near me that it was he had just delivered helped to deliver our son so basically so it was just me and him that were in the room at the time and he came out feet first and and kind of fairly easily I'd like well it didn't feel like it at the time but from the stories I hear and kind of giving birth feet first at home it was all went well and it sometimes doesn't so we were really lucky and he was getting loads of um adoration from all the nursing staff when we went into hospital and I was like I did the hard work <laughs> <laughs> where's my adoration yeah they were like congratulations you delivered your son what an amazing thing to do and I was like uh he was there I was doing all the hard work he kind of caught him at the end and picked him up but yeah it was really it's really nice story actually because it was just us and on paper, it should have been so very different. I was booked in for a cesarean and an epidural and all of these things. Wow. So, yeah. My, um, I so like many my things story. to touch on. I mean, it, it sounds like it was an experience. I mean, since you had been booked in for a C-section with an epidural, so you weren't expecting to feel all of the things that one feels or can feel giving birth because every birth is so different. And yet... And so there suddenly you were with this, like, hang on a second. This isn't like, it was so not how it was supposed to go that it wasn't even an option for you to consider and contemplate that you weren't in fact having horrific hunger pang pains, (laughs) which I'm not sure many people have (laughs) in that, in that level, but but how amazing, right? How our minds are just so capable of, of blanking out what is right in front of us or what is happening to us. Like the disconnect yeah. between mind yeah. and body, the body's like, mind's going, this isn't supposed to happen. This isn't happening. I'm just hungry. I'll have beans on toast. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. And your body's like, we're having a baby. We're having it. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. We're, we're, we're having it now, now the baby, now, now the baby, now, now. Right. Like if my body had a voice, that is exactly what it would sound like. Like, hello, come on. Hello, stop ignoring me. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> no, the shower's nice. It's all good. Yeah. And well, and, and what a good suggestion from your friend also made a bit of good suggestion to say, call the midwife. I know. Like it wasn't even, it wasn't in my mind to do these things so at all. And she was like, I think you should call them. And I was like, okay, if you think so. But in reality, when I look back, I was like, you were on your bed holding your stuff, like in pe- sweating because you were in that much pain. Cause it wasn't, mm. It was September. It wasn't hot. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still, like you said, it still wasn't, I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for him to arrive, even and though how, I was older. And how powerful that your mind was just like, no, this cannot be, this is not happening because this isn't the plan. And so many of us have birth stories where mind and body are so in opposition. I, I, was pregnant for 42 and a half weeks. 
with my first daughter. And I was, I was going to have a natural birth and I was going to be, you know, bouncing on the ball and doing all the hip circles and walking down the hall and like singing Kumbaya and all the things. (laughs) And I ended up, um, apparently, I don't remember this, but apparently they were concerned about, um, oh, I've just lost the term, but my blood pressure was going really high. I've literally just lost the term. I don't remember my blood pressure being high. I don't remember ever talking to the doctor about it. I don't remember any of the things. I remember being convinced and completely committed to having a supernatural, no, you know, epidural, you know, beautiful, yeah. easy birth. And it ended up being a, a scheduled, um, they tried to get the baby to come. God, my words this morning are just not coming. Um, and they were, they were inducing the birth. And so I was having contractions for eight hours against a brick wall. Like there was nowhere for my wow. baby to go. And then they were like, okay, we've got to get her out now. And it was an emergency yeah. C-section. And what followed was, you know, a crash into PTSD, terrible postnatal depression and anxiety. But I say that like it's nothing. It was horrific. I like. <laughs> but, and I've talked about it before many times on the podcast. However... Isn't it fascinating? And I've never thought about this, how incredibly powerful our minds are in that we're like, I was incapable of facing like I wanted so badly to be in control. I was so tense about wanting it to be so natural and easy Mm -hmm. (laughs) where I, I do see the irony now that I just wouldn't, I couldn't even couldn't even fathom the idea of scheduling a C-section because that was not yeah. how my like absolutely stubborn brain wanted it to go. And your mind was like, nope, I've been told this is how it's going to be. He's feet first, you know, potential problem, problem, problem. No, no, no. And then boom. There yeah. He was. Yeah. I, to start with, I was like, yes, we're going to have a water birth and da, da, da. And I was, and my mum used to be a midwife actually when she was younger and a, I would phone her and ask her for uh, along my pregnancy, lots of different advice. And I remember when they told me that he was feet first and if he didn't turn around in time, because up until about two, about a month before he was due, he was the right way. And then he just flipped over. Typical of him now that he's been here for eight years. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember phoning my mum and I was in tears because they said, you have to have a C-section. And then I said, I don't want one. I want to give birth to him naturally. And we had a really good um, lady, female registrar. And she said, you don't have to have one. But what we will suggest is that you come into hospital and potentially have an epidural and stuff. Because it's just, it's not that it's more dangerous. She was really, really good, actually. Because she said, it's not that it's more dangerous. It's just that it's not a practiced way. We don't have a lot of practice of delivering feet first or breech babies. So just to make everything a lot safer, this is what we want to do. But like, don't, don't stress about it because we can give it, we can get you as close as you possibly want to having a natural birth. You don't necessarily have to have a C-section because I was like, my first baby, I don't want to do that. Mm. And then afterwards I was like, okay, that's probably what's going to happen. But as I said, I was so convinced he wasn't going to be anywhere near his due date. I went to my friend's wedding two days before. My partner had a birthday party the same day as my friend's wedding. So I went to a wedding all day. I wore heels. <laughs> that must have been comfortable. My feet looked like little loaves of bread. Mm. <laughs> and then I went to a party afterwards. And then he came two days later. Right on but schedule. He, like you said. Yeah. The, two, days er- two days early, actually. Mm. And uh, my mind was telling me something completely different. And now I tell my son every day your whatever you decide will be your feelings about something is what it will probably be whatever you tell yourself is how you will feel about it and how you feel about it is how you will probably do it mm. and yeah I think it probably it, subconsciously it probably all stemmed from there because like I said I wasn't ready I don't remember certain things I've convinced myself that it was because I was hungry, which is ridiculous now to say well, out loud. But that's easy to say. <laughs> that's so easy to say with hindsight. But in the moment, you just were where you yeah. were, right? Yeah, I was so convinced. If you'd have spoken to me, I remember seeing, um, or like, so we live in a shared house. So there was other people in the house in the morning. And I remember seeing someone and I must have already been in labor because I'd gone down to get my beans on toast and going, hi, 
morning. She went, are you all right? And I went, yeah. Like all, f- <laughs> all fine. She left, went on her way. And yeah, there in hindsight, were. I was like, no, you should have said, no, I think you should stay home with me. I think I might be having my baby today. But no. Yeah. So let's zoom forward to, mm-hmm. so you, you have your son and you make a decision, a bunch of decisions that are not very common in the place that you live Mm -hmm. and you decide to live your life in a way that is perhaps contrary to what society might expect and for a really fascinating reason so can you tell me a little bit about that so when I had well when I got pregnant I'd already decided before he arrived that I wanted to I wanted to raise him so I was kind of fortunate because when I did get pre- only fortunate now at the time, I thought it was very unfortunate, but I was made redundant just before my, just before I was three months pregnant. So I hadn't told anybody. Wow. Um, but had I not been, I might have just kind of gone along with, I might not have done, but I may have just kind of gone along with the usual, you do your maternity leave and then you go back to work and da 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 but I'd been made redundant. And so during my pregnancy, I decided that I wanted to raise my son, meaning I didn't want to put him into daycare. I wanted to do all of the raising because I have, I didn't know, but again, once I got pregnant, I have seemed to have quite a strong moral set of rules that I want to impart to him. And I was like, even my mum, like, I guess I got them from my mum, but I didn't want my mum to raise him either I didn't want his other grandma to I wanted to do it so I decided that I was going to do that and stay home and he and he didn't go to nursery and I actually didn't want him to go to school either but he is there at the moment um because I feel like when they're so small you have such a massive influence on them or whoever they're around a lot they're like as everyone says, they're like little sponges and it's not just the stuff you're trying to teach them. It's all the stuff around them. They learn from everything. So I wanted him to learn that from me or or from my family or from the influences I'd chosen to be around him instead of something else. And I'm not saying that I don't disagree with school. I don't just disagree with nurseries, but I felt like it wasn't a choice I wanted to make. I feel they're like a great support if you need them, but I feel like they're more of a support. This is my own personal opinion. So it's not, I'm not down talking anyone that's chosen the other way. Um, But for me, it's more of a support for the parents. So if you need to go to work, there's a safe place for your children to stay. Mm. But I was like, I will, I'm not at work. This is an amazing opportunity to teach. Like I wanted to teach him to, I wanted to teach him to read. I wanted him to, to, I wanted to teach him to do maths and I wanted to teach him how to speak. I wanted to teach him his manners, all of those things. And also I wanted, like in hindsight, I can kind of contextualize and kind of vocalize these things a lot better than if I'd been trying to explain it at the time. Mm. But in hindsight, I wanted, um, I wanted him to know his parents as his first teachers and like his main his main influence like that's where you learn from I didn't want him to think that you only learn from school or other places because if you don't get on in school does that mean that you think you can't learn and I had read (laughs) I had read a lot of stuff about um how little black boys don't get on that well at school and he was a little black boy he still is He's still a little, yeah, he's, yeah, that's a battle. He thinks he's a big black boy, but he's not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he's eight years old, so he's starting to, everything is starting to shift, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of what I chose to do. But it was amazing the amount of comments that I got about my choice not to send him to nursery. And this is when he was tiny. He was like one or two, so still in nappies. uh, And people would tell me that, it's really sad that your son's not at nursery. Like people I didn't know that well, because they'd see me with him out in the daytime and be like, oh, he was very friendly. So he'd talk to a lot of people (laughs) and they'd say, oh, he's not at nursery. 
doesn't he have friends? Don't you want him to kind of meet other children? And I was like, he goes out every day. He meets different children every day. Like it's really not a problem. But it, if I was, I always say, if I was younger and less stubborn, and I did worry and I was older, but I would have worried a lot. It would have probably made me change my mind and send him to nursery because it was kind of a relentless narrative of you're doing something wrong because you're not doing what everyone else is doing. Hmm. Oh, that is, that is oh, all the dings going off in my head. Yes. Mm. And I wanted to also name that it is often a choice of the affluent to be able (laughs) to stay home with their children. I have been able to stay home with my kids because my husband had a BIG job and yes, he travels a lot, but it was because of his BIG job that I was able to stay home and didn't have to go out and work. And you are in East London, which for people who don't know London is not one of the wealthiest boroughs of the city and is not a place where you probably have heaps and heaps of mums saying, you know what, actually, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to choose to stay home and I'm going to find a way to make this work. It is to a large degree, a very privileged, often white, um, yeah, pri- privileged to stay home with your kids. And so there you are in East London, which in bits can be super scrappy and mm. it's not an easy environment necessarily to, to be raising kids in at a period Never mind when you start to stray from um, what is prescribed as the quote right or usual yeah. way of doing things, and so so you decided to to do that, which I honor because that's a ballsy move for any parent. Um, and you saying, you know, if you'd been younger, I'm what I'm hearing is that you listen to your knowing so as much as in the birth story you completely (laughs) ignored your body's knowing (laughs) you were like my head is right and I don't la 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 I don't care what you're doing down there um not interested maybe that was the lesson yeah right so as much as in the birth story that was the the approach in in the moment of perhaps complete overwhelm and un- unpreparedness, as you were saying, to, to live this experience alone in your house, um, you know, at the time and in the context. What I hear is that you have since very quickly, like maybe not instantly, but it sounds like super quickly, even before he was born, you've decided to listen to your knowing. And I really honor that because that is scary as hell. And when it's all of society cool. around you including people you don't know, (laughs) feel entitled and empowered to tell you what you're doing wrong as a mother, which is a whole other conversation we could fill this podcast with. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to acknowledge and honor the choices that you made then and that you make every single day still now, because you could be back at work. You could be back at work working for someone else. I mean, Mm -hmm. But you have decided not only to find an alternative way of supporting yourself and your son um, with whom you share a tiny space in which you live and love and learn and create art. And it's, you know, the two of you, the like Boots and his mama. In fact, if you're looking for Charmaine, you'll find her at Boots, B-O-O-T-Z mama on Instagram and you'll see her incredible work. And, And through your art, not only are you supporting the two of you, but you're also teaching him about the history of all the places you come from and all of the people who came before you and all of the situations that came before and are still now. So I'd love to, first of all, take a moment to honor all of that. Thank you. Makes me feel a bit emotional. Stop. (laughs) Emotions are okay. We have them all over this podcast. I didn't tell you that, but we get all emotional here because we're being real, right? And there has to be space for that. That's really important to me anyways, to like, to name that and to say, whoa, whoa, stop. It's really cool to hear it, hear that from somebody that I don't know. Like you're not saying it because you know me, Shemaine, you know what, you're just seeing the choice. And saying, yeah, do you know what? That's cool. That's brave. Because, yeah, it's really scary sometimes. I, don't, I never made tons of money. 
and I didn't have a way of making money when I decided to leave my, well, I didn't decide to leave. Well, I did. They said they were going to make me redundant. And I went that day, checked my bank account, told myself on my lunch break, if it's more than a certain amount, hand in your notice. And it was. So I handed in my notice and I didn't have a way. I didn't, in my mind, I hadn't decided how I was going to make more money, but I had decided that I can always make more money. I can't always have baby. a brand new baby. I can't mm-hmm. always have a one-year-old, a two-year-old. Like I wouldn't get that time back. And when I look back on it now, I am so grateful that I was, that my mum probably made me the way I am to be able to make that choice, to be brave enough to make that choice. And all of the stuff that I've learned and all of the things that I've shared with my son because I've been there. And I wouldn't know what I was missing if I hadn't been there. So I wouldn't feel sad if I hadn't been there. But now I know that, what I have had it's amazing it's very very nice and I don't regret kind of the times where I've kind of not been able to go out or I've not been able to buy certain things because I have stuff that more than money like money can't buy life it can't buy memories it can't buy experiences so yeah and and you are modeling for your son the values that you hold dear, right? And not only in the way that the two of you live, but also through the art that you create. And you use that art to tell stories to him. Yeah. And also you've mentioned to me in previous conversations to leave a legacy of mm-hmm. yourself and also to shine a light on different aspects of your heritage. So I'd like to, I'm just going to pin um, little black boys at school because we talked about that last time we spoke at length. And I also want to pin um, culture heritage. This time I'm writing it down because on a previous episode with Emma Stroud, I was like, oh, pin and then, oh, pin. And then, and I only remembered <laughs> one. So this time I'm actually writing it down. Um, cultural, culture heritage and legacy. No, not legal legacy. Okay. So let's go into that culture heritage and legacy piece because in looking at the art that you produce when our mutual friend julie crefield who was one of my earlier podcast guests suggested that i have a conversation with you as part of wanting to grow the conversation in mama fuel to include all kinds of mamas from all walks of society, all colors, all experiences, all family formats, et cetera. I went to your site and was blown away by your talent, but also by the thoughtfulness of why you paint the people that you paint and the way that you paint them. And I've loved watching some of your videos on Instagram where you show process. And so you show the initial sketch and then you show the different layers and how, how it all works together. Talk to us a little bit about why you paint who you paint and how you got there. So I, I think that it's really important for you for anybody so if I'm making another person which I've made like a little person it's going to be even more important for me to impart these things to him but I think it's really important for anybody to know who they are and be proud of that because that gives you your self-belief and like we me and my son have a little saying that we're like everybody is great some people just don't know that they're great Mm. and if you don't behave great if you don't know that you're great then you're not going to behave like you're great Mm. Just be, and it's just because you don't know. So my whole thing was I've got to let this little boy understand how great he is and all the things that make up him are part of the reason he's great. So the, the fact that he's got beautiful brown golden skin makes him great. And the reason that he's great is because it's his, why we always, because I never said, oh, you're, you're great because you're black. No, you're great because your skin is yours. Your skin is great because it's yours. Mm. And your skin looks like this. Um, so I try and kind of, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit lost. So okay. like you're, you're great because you're from this place. Like your mama is from, your mama's mama is from Trinidad. 
the culture of Trinidad is amazing. We have this beautiful thing called carnival. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So I draw these kind of things for him. So I draw like I have recently done a little trilogy of pictures from carnival. And anybody that knows me knows that carnival is like my part of my heart and soul. And I wanted to impart that to him because it's, it's so amazing. Like if you ever get to go, you have to go with, you have to go with a carnivalist, like someone that loves carnival, because it will be a totally different experience for you. And I wanted to share that with him because that brings me so much pride. Yeah. I remember when I was at school, I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm from Trinidad. My mum's a Trini. We have this great thing. And all like millions of people from all around the world come to London every year just to celebrate in our culture. Da, 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 da. All this. And I remember thinking I'm special because of this. So I wanted him to know that kind of stuff and he's too little to come to carnival at the moment I think yeah and um, crowds are too it, much the crowds are too much yeah. and it's kind of really busy and also it's my one time of year not to be a <laughs> mama necessarily yeah <laughs> but I still wanted him to know about it so I draw 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 it and when I'm drawing stuff he'll ask me like he's my he's my first art critic as it were I always ask him what he thinks about stuff so he always sees my things and I want him to look at the pictures I paint and and like them <laughs> but ask questions about them so it's what's that or who's that person or what does that mean or why has that person got a uh, tape over their mouth or why is that person sad or why is that person happy I want so basically the reason I draw the things I draw is not not just for him but he was my I guess he was my first point of reference when I was thinking of what I want people to say about my stuff but it's really for everybody that looks at it I want them to ask these same kind of questions so for example like this <laughs> this is a really cool story actually this lady here is uh, it's like an Angela Davis piece that I drew um and I wanted him to ask who she was because he does he, with everything actually anything he's that draws his eye he'll say who's that or do you know who that is as all little people do so I told him the story of Angela Davis, but there's another cool story because when my mum was younger, she had a massive afro like this and she got stopped in the airport. I think it was, she was traveling from America to go back to Trinidad or that was the stop off point. And she got stopped in the airport because they thought that she was Angela Davis. She had a massive afro and she kind of looked like her, but not really. Yeah. And they, they didn't believe that it wasn't her and she was detained for hours and <sighs> hours and hours. Um, so me drawing this picture and showing it to my son and having a story that relates to his family directly yeah. and the bigger picture of who Angela Davis was, what the Black Panthers was about, was really powerful for me. Um, and it all stems from him visually seeing something that kind of sparks his interest or he wants to know about, allows me like a little door to tell all of these stories. And that's why, that is the main reason I draw the things I draw because I want to open a door for him to ask questions and to be proud and for him to know in a in a way that's kind of still quite beautiful stuff that's not that beautiful like for him this is a really cool drawing that his mama did and the story behind it is really powerful but it doesn't sound as scary if you're just doing it very abstractly I guess yeah yeah, no, so, rather than rather than going into the history of the Black Panthers and why they existed yeah, and what they sit did. Down. Let's talk about yeah. Right. And and like even just without going into that, like the fact that your mother, a black woman with an afro, was detained because what? She was walking while because black. She had an afro. And yes. she had an afro. Had an afro right? In like, the airport. Yeah. And because all black people apparently are the same. Like learn to see people in their features and and for yes. who they are. Like it is it is part to me of a bigger conversation that and, and awareness that needs to happen and a, and a beginning to truly see people instead of this kind of homogene homogeneous treatment of yeah. I mean as we record this a black pre-med student was killed two days ago in her apartment in her house in oh, Fort Worth Texas trending. she was playing video games with her with her nephew that at 2 30 in the morning and a concerned neighbor saw the door was half open, called the police to say, I'm worried about her. Can you check? And the guy shot her through the window because she was in her house. Like, yeah, I, no. <laughs> so, yeah. so, 
so there is to me and and even as a privileged white woman it's a like oh yeah check yourself these are things that i don't have to think about and i raising my black my black my white daughters don't have the same lens and the same concerns and the same experiences yeah. having my children moving out in the world as you do with a little, or I assume you do, I'm making an assumption, I'm sorry. No, yeah, 100%. No, me and my you know? cousin were talking about the same thing, like it, having to, like one of the saddest things, or it, not when I'm talking to him, but when I think about our conversations, um, is me having to sit down to a little boy and explain to him that because of the way he looks, some people will think he's naughty. Uh and already have thought he's naughty or if he's in a situation um involving people that are not the same color as him that he may not get the same treatment because and it's so hard and me and my cousin were talking about this yesterday actually and it's not a conversation that everybody has to have with their children no and it's, it's really sad to know that and it's not always easy to know how to broach that or form formulate that conversation with like an eight-year-old or a six-year-old or whenever you feel that you need to start it and unfortunately when you have bait well for me personally when I had him I didn't you don't think I'm going to have to teach this baby that people are not going to like him but some Along the way, an incident will happen that will sharply remind you that yes, you do, because you, when you have them, you see the like their world. Oh, it's they're amazing. They can do anything they want. That's your first thought when you yeah. look at your. And you see their like, beauty and their, their innocence. Yeah, 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 and that's all you see. And then very, very sharply, and not consciously either. That's kind of the main. That's one of the bigger issues. People don't consciously look at him and they're like I don't I think you're naughty it's the subconscious yeah. teaching that sits behind here somewhere where you subconsciously believe that he's going to be naughty that is the problem yeah you're there is an there's a there's a baseline suspicion yeah. and watchfulness that yeah. will occur if you see a bunch of 15 year old yeah. maybe a bunch of 15 year old black kids yeah. That you might not feel, depending where you are in London or where you are in the world, that me, would you feel that way if it was a bunch of 15 year old white kids? I don't know. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the podcast episode that I recorded with Celia Ward Wallace, who is, you know, like me, blonde, 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 blue eyed, fair, fair, fair skinned, married to an African American man and has these tall, remarkably like striking young women as daughters and, and how, how they move through the world differently. How she says in the, in the podcast interview, I'll link to, she says that when they go out together as a family, she drives the car because she knows that in South LA, South central LA, where they live, if her husband's driving the car, they might get pulled over and he might have really huge issues with the police because they think maybe he's, he's kidnapped a white woman. And yeah, it's really scary. So, so yeah, I, I, I cannot imagine because I am not in the situation because yeah. my kids are white and so am I, but it's really important to me having had that conversation with Celia and, and having other conversations with people of all different colors to start to understand things that I don't ever have to think about and that my kids don't ever have to think about and start to have those conversations with my kids about, um, you know, suspicion and yeah. how people are treated simply based on, on that, that pre-programmed societal uh, prejudice, which yeah. is what you're talking about, right? Like it's yeah. not even a conscious decision yeah. to be like, oh, here comes, you know, here's the little black boy in my class. He's going to be naughtier than, yeah. than the white boys. It's, it's, it's hopefully not conscious, yeah. but you know, what is the reason that, and this is coming back to one of my other pins, um, you were talking about black boys at school and, and the failure rate and the, the, the dropout rates yeah. and the issues there. There's a, a really great um, Instagram account called Dr. Dyslexia. 
that I will link to. And he is a, an African-American who is deeply dyslexic and didn't know that he was deeply dyslexic until he was, I want to say in high school, like quite far on in high school. And he was failing out of everything and teachers were writing him off. And it, it was only when this teacher said to him, you know, you're dyslexic, right? That every, like the penny dropped and that he was able to start getting the help. And so he now has as his mission to help get the word out because apparently there's a higher proportion of dyslexia and other learning differences amongst black kids in America. I can't speak for wider than that, but I remember reading that stat somewhere with him. And he goes and speaks to school communities, teachers, and kids to highlight this situation because those kids are less likely to get help. They're more likely to be written off as being problem kids, having behavioral issues. And so they don't even, they don't even get into the learning support. The schools that they're often in and they're in their ghetto neighborhoods won't have the funds and won't have the people going in to support them. And so there's a higher failure rate and dropout. And so when you look at incarcerated populations, I cannot remember the stat and I'll try to find it. Um, the, the, the statistic about the number of dyslexic or other, otherwise learning challenge, like d learning differentiated people mm -hmm. is like, it's over 65%. And what's the percentage of the American incarcerated population that's black? It's huge. It's like 85% or something. Yeah. So you put those stats that's together crazy. and think, oh my God, it's, it's real. <clears throat> it most definitely is. And I think there's a, really important thing to note about kind of the education system and kind of people's perspective of whether or not you're good or smart or because it's very prescriptive like mm -hmm. okay this is what we're going to teach you and this is the way we're going to teach you and if you can't learn it in this way then you're somehow a failure and that doesn't run for everyone even if you're even if you don't have a learning impairment as such it's because then my, my thing is teachers and it's not an easy job. And I think that they're actually amazing people with a, a whole heap of dedication for other people's children. But I also think that they're not given kind of the support that they need to have to be able to teach 30 different children who may potentially have 30 different ways of learning mm -hmm. something. And because they're children, you're not just teaching them maths, you're teaching them about who they are like how to feel about their their own potentials like it's a huge responsibility to be a teacher because mm -hmm. in actual fact what I've done by putting my child in school is I've given my child to you to raise for part of the week as far as I'm concerned like that's how I look at it because he everything that you do he's learning from like everything like the way that you treat him the way that you treat him in compared to someone else or the way that you talk to him or the way that he, um, where he sits in his class, all of that stuff he's learning about kind of where he, how he is, where he fits in in comparison to other people. So it's massively, massively important. And my thing is, if you only have one way that you can teach something, but all the stats show you that there's various different ways of learning or getting to the end point. Yeah there's going to be a mismatch. Like I was saying to you when we last spoke, I read um, in Arcala's book and I can't actually remember what the book is called. It's called Natives. I can't remember. I'm going to, I'm going to double check that, but it's a really, really great, but it is, it's his, the latest book that he's written. Um, and I, I didn't read it. I audibled it because you know, <laughs> that's reading, that's reading. And what's the author's name is? It's Arcala. He's a British rapper. So anyone that's watching yes. this in Britain, you probably have heard of him. He's an amazingly articulate young man who kind of speaks on kind of cultural issues and uh, kind of the way that especially, particularly black boys are kind of treated here and failed mm -hmm. as well, or kind of very much pigeonholed into a, um, a, a certain category and then written off. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't excuse like the behavior or anything like that, but he's very much like, you uh you are criminalizing the behavior or a situation that somebody is in you're criminalizing them and punishing them instead of 
thinking, well, how do I fix this situation mm. so that these people are not in this situation? So actually they have the same choices or they have the same opportunities yeah. as other people. And, you know, like even I was um, reading, I wasn't reading, I was on Facebook um, and I, was, I saw a clip by Trevor Noah and he was referencing the... Um, the gentleman that was shot in his own apartment by the police officer yeah. lady that trial yeah. and he was talking about the um the reaction from the judge and the reaction from the brother and kind of the multitude of reactions that people had because the judge hugged the lady that shot the man and gave her a bible and the brother hugged the lady as well and he's like he can understand the anger and he can understand the kind of you know we should raise ourselves above the situation and forgiveness is the best way and all these other things. But the main thing that he came out with, which I love and try to live by is it's not that everybody should be treated. It's not that you should look at this situation and be like, Oh my God, she should be punished and the key thrown away and da da da. What an awful person. He's like, when you look at this situation, what he thinks and what I think, and which is the way I think we should all learn from is why isn't everybody afforded the same approach i.e she was treated like she was a human being that made a very bad mistake and it was so sad that she had messed up this greatly but she wasn't she wasn't vilified for her horrendous choice and what happened her horrific judgment horrific judgment she and it's not to say it's not to say she doesn't deserve to be but it's as a justice system and as a set of people and as a world, why do we not look at people that make those mistakes and still treat them like everybody treat everybody as human beings? Yeah. She's ruined her life. She's killed somebody. It is sad. Yeah. So when young black boys who don't have the training she had, don't have the opportunity, she had do the same thing, make horrible mistakes. Why are they not afforded the same kind of humanity? humanity? Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that completely stood out because I see that with already I've seen situations with my son at school where he's not afforded the same level of understanding as a little white child that has done something similar. Like he had his he had an incident where his he was playing a game in the playground with about eight other kids. They all got in trouble because they shouldn't have been playing the game. The game was too rough. And in the game, he hurt somebody by mistake. The little boy got up and was angry. So he punched my son in the mouth. This is what the other children told me. And his tooth came out. My son's tooth mm. came out. The school didn't tell me. My son told me. They didn't write an accident report form. The next day, his, they, kept, they told me, oh, his tooth is still sore. It's kind of bleeding still. So it was clear it wasn't ready to come out. I thought it was ready to come out when I saw that his tooth was missing. I was like, oh, because it was a bit wobbly. But it was all swollen here. And the teacher said to me the next day, oh, he's, he's saying his tooth is really sore and it's still swollen and bleeding a lot. And that happened for two further days. It later transpires that the teacher told him to come up to the front of the class and tell everybody why he lost his tooth. Um, they all lost their playtime for playing this rough game, but nothing happened that the, the incident between him and this other little boy, who's his friend and is a lovely little boy, but still nothing happened to this little boy. So I was like, okay. Fast forward a couple of weeks, my son is playing with a little boy and grabs his hood of his jacket and somehow his face, the other little boy's face gets scratched. The teacher thinks it was the zipper, but some the little boy thinks it was uh, my son's fingernails. But anyway, he had a scratch across his face. In that incident, my son got taken into the behavioral, the head of the behavioral team's office and spoken to about his behavior. Uh, The other little boy's parents were called and told about the incident. There's an incident report form, all these things. And I wrote an email and said, listen, I'm, what is the difference between these two situations? Why? Why has my son been treated? Why is the situation different in these situations when one, he's the aggressor and one, he's the victim? Because in both scenarios, he's been treated like the aggressor, both Mm -hmm. scenarios, even Mm -hmm. when he's not or when he's been the injured party. 
Um, and it wasn't something that they could really answer. And again, it's that subconscious stuff. I don't think they actively believed that they were treating those two situations differently. But from a mum's point of view. And what objectively, and I'm not his mum, obje- objectively. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and from his point of view, my thing is, it's not that you can't make mistakes, but when you do make mistakes like that, or you don't kind of address them, what message are you sending to him? Yeah. About his value and about, about his, his, how much he yes. deserves to be respected yes. and listened to and be allowed to make yes. mistakes. Yeah. The, um, the book that you were talking about is called Natives in the Empire, I think. Yes. Yes. Because you had yes, told me about yes. it and I had written it down. So Natives in the Empire by Akala. It is an amazing book. And in that book, it speaks about kind of uh, like they test the academic level of, in, in terms of reading and writing of young black, I think it's boys in particular, but I could be wrong. Um, young black boys or children before they start school, the school system in the UK. And on average, it's like certain points above average. So they're, ahead in this in this uh in this set of statistics before they start school and by the time they leave school like leave secondary school like in a majority they are many many points below average and so what is it that happens during school and I'm not saying that teachers are teaching them badly because again it's not it's not just one factor but no there's a significant trend of they have a certain level before, then they go through a system yeah. that does much more than just teach you maths, English, and whatever else. It tells you and who you we- are every single day. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then they come out and they're, they're less than. And it, I was like, that's not, that's not for my son. No. Every day, <laughs> he doesn't like it, but every day we do um, lessons. And we do lessons because, not because I want him to be smart, because I want him to know his potential yeah. from me. I want him to know that he can, even if he chooses not to, which I don't want him to do, but if he chooses not to, I want him to know that he can. My whole deal of wanting to be his first teacher, wanting yeah. to have him achieve a certain level before he even entered the school system is because I wanted him to have self-confidence because I I know from having a brother that went through the school system that is super smart and very successful now, but still has kind of the issues that he had at school with thinking he's not smart. He has two businesses and his own house and all the things that I don't have in, but he, cause he never went to university and his school teachers told him in writing, he will never be successful. (gasps) Oh God that he believes that he, that that's something he continuously has to work at. And I'm like, you are successful. You've already done it. You didn't, you made your own path. And actually he's a really good example now. And I tell him every day, you're a really good example from other little boys. You don't have to finish school. You don't have to get the the tick from school to be successful. You can make your own way. It is definitely a path for success, but Mm -hmm. it's not the only path. Um, And and that's just real. I could talk about this all day and I kind of go in and out of it because it's really important to me. It's like a big, it's like a big bugbear for me and not because I think it's wrong. I just think it's not understood. And I think everyone kind of sees school and the government's version of education as the be all and end all of education and the authority on education. And I don't think and And there is so much, we've talked about this before on the podcast many times with, with different guests about there is so much formatting that goes on and we are taught in school to do as you're told and listen yes. and keep your mouth shut and don't get in trouble and don't get noticed unless it's because you're brilliant, et cetera, et cetera, that we are to like, we are not taught to disobey. We are not taught to um, question the rules or to break the rules, even less if you are a child of color, because, oh my goodness, the cards are stacked against you, right? If my white girl child decides to break a rule and disobey, she will not be treated the same way as her black male classmate. She won't. We're in Geneva. It's a different context, you know, international schools, et cetera. But the likelihood is that's going to play out certainly in, in vast swaths of, of, you know, Western Europe and, and the world, certainly in North America. Yeah. I mean, you just, 
you just have to read the news to see that that's happening. But um, it is, there's so much that, that we don't even realize that we, as white people, or just non, non-Blacks, none of color, because it's not also limited to black people. Asian people face huge discrimination. People from the Middle East who, you know, women who wear the hijab. I also did an interview. Um, I've just lost her last name. Charlene. She's a Charlene. I can't remember her last name. Suddenly a little tired today. Um, We did an episode where she spent a month wearing the hijab because her birth father is of Persian origin. And so she wanted to feel what it was like to walk through London to walk through the UK wearing a hijab and what was the experience, what was the immigrant experience like? And so there is so much that is, that is unspoken because for many of us, we don't realize it. Or if we do, it's a lot easier to not speak. It's a lot Mm -hmm. more comfortable to just keep going on as we are, because when you sit in the seat of privilege, that is the case. And so I'm really grateful to you for being part of this conversation, for being willing to go through the fear of being on a podcast and sharing your story and talking about your ideals and the beautiful ways that you are mindfully raising your son. And I wanted to ask you two more questions. One, I wanted to ask you about a work of art. There are so many. The one about the one with the mouth taped up is one that I would like to talk about. And the other one is the nurse who on the one side is this beautiful, vibrant nurse and on the other side is weeping and aged. And can you can you tell us about those two works of art and I'll link to them? Okay, so the nurse one is a piece that I did for it was a competition. One of my friends forwarded me some information about uh, entering a com- an art competition um, and the theme was black and British and I was like oh what shall I do and I kind of (laughs) had spoken I kind of like to be I don't like I don't think of myself as political but actually Julie is like you're really political you know your stuff Mm -hmm. but it's just you have things to say yeah yeah and but but I'm thinking this is just my this is just how I feel but I guess yeah it is political but um at that time there was or the summer before there was a whole heap of uh stuff about the Windrush generation and there was a massive scandal here in the UK where um, people who had been invited over in the 40s and 50s to come to England from the Caribbean to work um, were now being deported. How Um, many years ago was this? Like uh, started 1948 is when they kind of started inviting them over and so and the, de- the, the scandal, starting to be deported was when 2018 uh, in on like a big scale so like so like five seconds ago yeah basically yeah and 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 it's still happening so it's not a big news story now but it's still happening there's people that have lived here Caribbean ladies and gentlemen who've had children here who paid taxes here who were invited when the Caribbean was a colony of the United Kingdom. So they were like, their queen was our queen. They were invited. They did not need passports. They were part of the Commonwealth. Um, So these people that were here at that time and have invested in the country, whether they've worked or paid taxes or whatever they have done, are now being asked to leave. And so I... For me, being black and British at the time when the competition was up, that was the big thing that stuck in my mind about it. I was like, you talk about um, people, lots of people know about Windrush as this shit that came over um, and loads of, Car- that's how lots of Caribbean people ended up working, living and working in England. But not loads of people, except for this new story, which is no longer a new story. Lots of people do not know that these same people are being thrown out of the country by the same government that invited them here. And part of the part of the kind of sadness about it is all knowingly, as far as I'm concerned. It's not an accident. They came over. They didn't need passports, but they had uh, like um, there was like records, cards that identified like a landing who they card. were. Yeah. yeah that 
the government kept and also actively destroyed a few years ago. It's all like it's all written in in uh, in government records. So they destroyed this information, knowing that this may be the only identification that these people have that you have invited them over. Should you ever ask for it, the same government that destroyed the information is the same government that is asking for the information. So my thing is, if you know that you have asked, for, if you know you've destroyed it, why are you asking for it? as a form of identification. You do not need, a not everybody in the country needs a passport. You would only have a passport should you have the financial means to travel. Mm. If you don't, you're not gonna have one. I remember, this could have been my parents, because I remember when I was at school, my parents both came from Trinidad to here. My mum came over as a nurse, and my dad came over to study engineering. Um, and then he ended up working in um, in the hospital as well. So he went into the uh, medical arena as well. And I remember when I was at school, my mum had the foresight to get a British passport. They didn't have one before. They would travel on their Trinidadian passports. They didn't need a, why would you need a UK passport when Trinidad used to be part of England? Of the empire, yeah part of yeah part of the empire and so that nurse piece was kind of all about that it the the one side is the young vibrant proud lady um that's coming over she has like a nurse's hat on and she's very young and kind of sparkly eyes quite beautiful and there's some text in the background that says come your country needs you you're welcome there's jobs here for you um help out your country be proud of being part of the commonwealth and then the other side is fast forward 40 50 years later when she's older i still wanted her to look proud so hopefully she still looks kind of very proud but she's hurt because she's spent her youth in a country that invited her over that all of a sudden has just turned its back on her and is telling her we don't know who you are who are you if you can't identify yourself, go back. You must go back because we don't know who you are. And like, imagine if that was just one person. Imagine if that was a friend of yours that said that. Imagine like teenagers, you get invited to a party, you turn up at the door or you, you're in the party having fun. You've bought food, you've bought other things. And then everybody in the party or the majority of people in the party and the host of the party turns around and says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Get out. Nobody wants you here. Show, show me who you are. And you're like, I don't have any. Why would, you, why would I have ID? You invited me. You know, it's that like that. For me, I don't think people understand the hurt. Like it, aside from everything else, like people have lost their houses. People have lost their income. And people have been separated from their children. People go back to a country they don't know anymore. They've been here for 50 years. Just the pure hurt and um, sense of not being important enough to care mm. about. You're ruining this person's whole life because you can't be bothered to either check the records because there will be some sort of record mm. or there will be some sort of level of investigations that you can do to find out whether or not they were, they came over here during that period of time. Mm. Even if it's, you can look at their tax records and see when they've been paying tax. Like yeah. when the tax man, when you owe the tax man money, he's very, very, very quick to know all of your information sure. saying 112 years ago. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but when it's for your benefit, anyway, the Windrush thing was just, it was so important to me because I was like, that could be my parents. My mum came over as a nurse yeah. and it feels like it's this major story that kind of, is quite complex, yeah. but like, again, showing it to my son, it's a simple story. He can see, hopefully he and other people can see the emotions involved in that complex story in one picture. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to paint that to kind of relate to sometimes what it's like to be black and British because it's not all, it, um, it's great, but it's not always great. Yeah. It's not always great to not be welcomed in a country that you believe is your, your home. home. Yeah. And the one with the paint, the, the tape on the one with the tape on the mouth was a quick sketch I did. And actually, I'm going to embarrass myself because I can't remember the name of uh, the guy now. But I was watching 
a Black Panther documentary. Um, and one of the stories that it was telling in the documentary was that one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party had been arrested um, and he was up in court for um, the things that he had been arrested for. And he was being very kind of belligerent. He wouldn't, he wouldn't stop talking. The judge was talking and he was talking, talking and trying to kind of express himself. Mm-hmm. And um, the judge kept telling him to be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. I think he was actually representing himself. He didn't have a lawyer. He was representing himself. Um, but he was, he, he, the, the way they portray it, he wasn't being very submissive. So he wasn't just sitting there like, yeah. okay, yes, no. He was being very outspoken, very loud. They asked him to be quiet. He wouldn't be quiet. So the judge taped his mouth. This is like, this isn't even that long ago. This is in the lifetime of my mum. My mum was in her 20s when this was happening, 20s or 30s when this was happening. They taped the man's mouth in an official court in the proceedings yeah. in the courtroom. For me, that was amazingly crazy. Like, what? Horrifying. Crazy okay to do that. Yeah. Yeah. As a, in, a, in, a, in an official capacity. And the message was just so alarming for me. It was like, you do not matter you are not yeah don't speak I don't need to treat you with respect because I guarantee you had they viewed the person with any kind of esteem yeah you wouldn't tape up someone's mouth because you don't want them to talk tape it up and have him sit there they didn't even remove him like okay you can't behave you need to go back until you can which happens probably every day in courtrooms all across the world yeah but to tape up his mouth and I just think it was so significant so I drew the sketch and again showed it to my son it opened the door to hear a story about kind of it's a bit sad I guess to tell him these things but the same privileges that afforded to other people even other people that have committed crimes so they're they're already Mm -hmm. in a they're, they're, they're already seen as a certain type of person or they're they're kind of being investigated as to whether or not they've created if you are black sometimes you're not afforded the same kind of respect look at this this was when grandma was alive um and it was just really important for me to capture that because out there was so many things in the documentary but that one image kind of sums up how it feels like it is in america again or still still yeah and i'm like and and england's not too far behind i mean i guess it's less obvious and it's not kind of as out there I don't know I don't know that it's not so I think there's having lived in the UK briefly for a couple of years there is so much that is unspoken and and I think that the current political climate both in the UK and in the US at time of recording in October of 2019 is one in which the way that the leaders of both countries current leaders of both countries behave has given permission to lots of people to behave in similar ways with impunity where before um, it has emboldened people to behave in those ways where before they may have behaved in those ways on a smaller scale or recognizing on some level that the the injustice of what they were doing and so maybe being less obvious about it but I'm not sure I'm not at all sure that it isn't happening in fact I'm certain no it most definitely is happening it's here happening, and it's happening on a broad scale mm-hmm. it's just again is it being reported and do people do people know about it and do they want to know about it because yes. it's very easy you know you think about many different cultures in the last, you know, 150 years where you look at the rise of horrific leadership and then the, you know, you, you look at the Holocaust and and people will, you know, history says that it was really difficult for people who were living in Germany at the time to oppose themselves because of the way that the culture was and the country was and that, you know, you, it's, it's easy for us from a distance to judge. And to say, yes. how could you possibly? But you look at the U.S. and think, how could you possibly have ha- have allowed this person to come into power? And I'm not at all comparing the two. I'm not putting them on a parallel. But but there is a 
a degree, I feel, of turning away, of just turning away yeah. because that's uncomfortable and turning away because that's painful and I don't want to see it and getting involved yeah. may put me in danger or may, may cause some kind of challenge in my life. And, and I, I want to ask you now two final questions, one of which is, what can we do as a, as a society and this is a huge question that I wasn't planning on asking you, but it's just yeah. to my heart. What yeah. can, what can we do as a society to do things better? What can we do as, and I, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to objectify you as like the spokesperson for, you know, the black community in the UK. That's not at all. <laughs> that's not, not sure. my objective um, <laughs> because that's a lot of pressure. And how could you possibly speak for such a diverse, <laughs> such a diverse community? Right. But, mm -hmm. but what can, what can we as mothers do within our families and within yeah. our communities to contribute somehow to shifting the narrative or to contribute somehow to, changing the way that we interact with each other yeah. because in the podcast episode that i published yesterday which was the 14th of october 2019 with m stroud she and i were talking about how we often interact with each other as mum to mum and we don't interact with each other on a person a human to human level and there's mm -hmm. so much of that that is that is conditioning and yes. so how can we rethink? How can we question? How can we get curious? How can we be brave? And I feel like this conversation is a carry on in some way of that conversation. How can we do things differently with our kids and with the society that we're in to shift the narrative or to become more aware? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, so that's a massive question. Thanks. <laughs> but As we're way over the hour time that I usually try, I'm to, sorry. try to do. No, 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 no. It's not you. Sorry. It's I just want to keep asking all the questions. Um, uh, let's, so this will be our penultimate I... question. I, I, so that, that question is a question I ask myself all the time. Like having, I think, again, being a parent is a massive responsibility. And I remember kind of feeling kind of the pressure of I'm raising a person to be a person with individual thoughts and influence in the world when I'm, when I'm not here, like this is, this little person is going to be an adult that's going to do things that's going to change how somebody else feels and how they view themselves. and other people will do the same to him and like, what am I going to do? And how am I going to, how am I going to make him a good person? Um, and I always remember my aunt who sadly passed away now, Auntie Mavis, absolutely lovely little Trinidadian lady. Um, and she always said to me and to my mom, you don't have to like somebody to be kind to them. Mm. Um, and, and, if you remember that narrative, you, you can't go far wrong. You can't, you, you don't have, like, I, I also tell my son never to ignore anybody. So if somebody asks him a question, I say very politely answer. You don't have to answer the question, but don't ignore them. Like I think we have a culture where we're frightened of strangers and stranger danger. And, and that means don't talk to people. And I think you can't ignore a person. They're another human, but you don't know what they want. They could need help. Again, it's, it's, it's so tricky because you don't want anything to happen to your children or, or anyone you love. So kind of how do you protect them? And I feel like most of the issues are people trying to protect themselves from a, some sort of perceived danger. But I think we have to be more open and teach children how to be open and communicative without being without making themselves too vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So I always tell him if someone speaks to him, speak back, even like the homeless people, if they're asking me for money, I never ignore them. Cause I'm like, if my son was homeless, would I want people to treat him like that? Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't. I always think if, if somebody you love was in that situation, how would you want them to be treated? If my son committed a crime, God forbid. I wouldn't want him to be treated like he still wasn't my son who had cried and laughed and been a little boy once and all of those things yeah. so that's what I try and teach him and I think and it sounds very hippified and I know but I think it's a really simple case of just be kind uh, talk to people find out stories you may not like somebody but if you understand them 
you can keep your distance for them, but you have a level of understanding and level of respect where you're not going to mistreat somebody or you're not going to put judgments on them without knowing anything about them. Um, it's a massive question with so many answers, but my bottom line is you don't have to like somebody to be kind. Mm. And that's what I try and teach my son. And I, I try and try and tell him as many stories about the things that are current in the world, like good and bad stories. So he has knowledge, like knowledge is the biggest kind of empowerment that I can give him to make his own, his own judgments. Mm. So be kind and be knowledgeable. Okay. So my last, last question is where do you get your mama fuel? Because you are his everything at the moment. And where do you, yeah, where do you get get your fuel? I don't know. (laughs) I think I get it from him. I really, really do. Because notoriously, before he was born, I was notoriously not a waker upper. I did not get up early. (laughs) I didn't kind of, I was very, I'm very good at making things work. So if I don't have enough money, instead of getting more money, I'll just make the stuff I have work. If I don't, I was very good at getting jobs that I didn't have to wake up for at nine (laughs) o'clock in the morning. (laughs) I'd get ones that I could go in at 12 and finish late. So I'd always make things work. But with him, it's not about what works for me. It's about what works for him. Um, And I think my drive and my passion comes from knowing that what I do is how he views the world and how he will view himself and his place in the world and how he will view other people. And for me, he is massively important because I'm going before he is touch wood. I'm going before he is. I'm my, my whole job here is to leave a legacy of greatness. And I want him to believe his whole job here is to leave a legacy of greatness. Mm. And that's where I get my, I think I'm at must be because I don't know where else it would come from. I look at him and I think, no, I have to, I have to do better. Like if I am telling you that you need to be X, Y, and Z, I must first be X, Y, and Z. Mm. I must show you that it's possible. So I think he, he is, he is my main mama fuel, but my mama is a big fuel as well. My mama is a major thing for me too. Mm, I love that. The, the generational sandwich in every way that it can be delightful. Oh, Charmaine, I could talk to you and talk to you and talk to you. And I remember that we have not spoken about your beautiful pins that you make because you wanted to make art accessible to everyone. So what I will do is I will include a link in the show notes to the pictures in your Instagram, to those specific um, images, because Charmaine has wanted to make sure that, you know, you wanted to make sure that your community around you in East London could access and own a piece of original art and in making your art available on metal pins that people put on their jackets and backpacks, you have really allowed people who would very likely not have been able to enter the art market to have a Charmaine Philip original. And I think that that is really awesome. So I will link into that because I really wanted to come on that, but the conversation just didn't head that way today. So thank you. So no, you don't have to be, you don't have to apologize. They never go where I think they're going to go. And it's <laughs> one of the beauties of, of these conversations. Thank you so much for your courage and your generosity and just being who you are and living life the way that you show up. Thank you for being my guest today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and letting me chat. <laughs> it's, I, I've loved it. I'll speak soon. Mm, That conversation went on longer than I expected, but it was so good that I just didn't want it to end. And in fact, when we stopped recording, Shermaine and I just kept talking about so many of the issues that we could have raised and didn't, including the fact that she makes these incredible pins that make art accessible, her beautiful art accessible to people in her community. She is in fact just announcing at time of recording a new series of five pins and so I will put the link to that Instagram post because that's where she showcases her work and if you would like to support Charmaine in getting her art out into the community and would just like to own a piece of really beautiful original art by her you can click on that link and find out where her work is available. Also Part of the reason I love having these conversations in the container of Mama Feel the Podcast is because I get 
to talk to all different kinds of mamas. And every time what strikes me is our shared experience and our shared humanity, irrespective of where we are socially, educationally, physically, geographically, relationship-wise, etc. We all love our kids, and we are all trying so hard to do our best. And often, we're forgetting ourselves. That's why I know, and I have witnessed myself and my own being amongst my friends and in the dozens and dozens of women that I have worked with through Mama Fuel, both through my sisterhood membership and also through hosting live urban retreats over the last few years, I know the benefit of stopping and taking time for yourself. And I also know how hard that is. I know that sometimes we will protect time for ourselves and then we just take a little bit longer to get out the door or we, like I do, take just a few minutes to throw in that extra little laundry or faff around picking the shoes and then it's too late to go to the yoga studio or it's too late to go on that run or you miss the kickoff of that event or whatever it is. And I want to encourage you so much to take the time and once you've made that commitment to follow through on it, not to let yourself down. Of course, there are circumstances and situations in which you know, your kid spikes a huge favor and you need to take them to the A&E or you're not feeling well, whatever it is. But if you can do your utmost to live up to your promises to yourself, if you can do your utmost to protect time, to nourish yourself, you will be a completely different being than you are if you spend all of your time rushing around, racing, cramming as many things into your waking hours and probably into some of the hours you could be sleeping it just isn't sustainable. So if you are in Switzerland and you'd like to come and meet me in Egg, in Zurich, or in Geneva, there will be three more urban retreats at time of recording, at time of publishing rather. And I would love to welcome you. The November one in Geneva is looking pretty full. So make sure that you sign up for that. All you need to do is go to mamafuel.me forward slash urban retreats and sign up for one of those dates in November or December. And I would love, love, love to meet you there for four hours of complete and utter pampering and nurturing of your mind, body, heart, and soul. We will do some light yoga, meditate, laugh together, talk together. We might even bust out and have a dance party depending on the vibe of the day. And I would love for you to be there. And again, if you can't be there and you'd love for me to bring the urban retreat to you, just drop me an email at anneanne at mamafuel.me and I would be delighted to travel to wherever you are. I'd love also to hear what you thought of this episode. So in a few minutes, I'll tell you how to do that. Thanks so much. I'll see you next week. That's it for this episode of Mama Fuel, the podcast. Thanks for listening. There's a lot more conversation, sharing, and real mama talk happening in our private Facebook group. To join the virtual village, go to www.mamafuel.me forward slash Facebook. That's M-A-M-A-F-U-E-L dot M-E forward slash Facebook. And be sure to say hi when you get there. If you like this episode, or if you know a mama who could use a little mama fuel, and let's face it, we all have times when we're running on fumes, I'd love you to share this episode and to rate it and leave a review. The algorithms work that way. The more reviews there are and the more sharing there is, the more mamas will be able to feel encouraged and supported with the conversations that you just listened to in Mama Fuel. Every comment helps and it's always a super delight to hear from you. Thanks and bye for now.